Good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Uh, for those, those of you who don't know me, either tuning in live or watching the recording, I'm Gerard O'Sullivan. I'm head of the Department of uh, Technology and Enhanced Learning here in MTU Cork. Uh, so thanks to everyone for coming along. I can see people are still joining us, uh, but we have a, a nice number here already, I think, especially for a, a weekday uh, lunchtime uh, event. Uh, a very special welcome as well for staff joining us from uh, from MTU Kerry. Uh, great to have you along and uh, hoping you can make um, more of these uh, sessions. Uh, so following on from Derek Cassidy's uh, talk last week, we have uh, another great speaker for you today. No pressure, Catherine. Uh, Dr. Catherine Cronin, who is uh, currently strategic uh, education developer at the National Forum for the enhancement of teaching and learning, but is also a well-known writer and advocate in the area of open educational resources and open educational practices. Uh, Dr. Cronin's session is going to look at the many potential benefits for, for staff, for students, for the university at, at large, I think, of, of using and developing uh, open educational resources and engaging with open educational practices. So I've seen Catherine speak uh, many times before, and I think we're in for a session that really nicely balances some of the ideology of the OER um, movement with some very practical examples and uh, directions for us to, to take away. Uh, there's also going to be some time for questions and discussions. And uh, on that subject, encouraging people to use the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of the Zoom interface there to make uh, any observations or uh, store up some questions for the end. So that's it for me, I think. Um, I'll be lurking here, Catherine, if you need anything, but um, over to you for now. And thank you so much. Okay, that's really great. Thanks so much, Gerard. And thanks to everyone who's here. Just, I know your time is very precious, so I hope I can live up to that introduction, Gerard. And just as you were speaking, I realized I probably did say potential benefits in the description that I sent you, but I mean, I'm hoping to that it'll be quite balanced as well, because, you know, in, in, in looking at benefits and challenges, you know, because of course it isn't all just about uh, what's possible, but also, you know, about the challenges as well. So I'll just share my screen here. Is that clear there? Yeah, looks good. Okay, that's great. Okay. Um, as Gerard said, uh, I am based at the National Forum, so I'll be speaking a lot today just about um, a lot of the resources and so on that the National Forum has available. But my own background is um, in IT and also in uh, teaching and learning at NUI Galway. So, you know, I have you know, many years where I practiced as an open educator, you know, using open educational practices with students and with staff. Um, I've done research in the area. So, uh, so hopefully, you know, in addition to sharing some resources about what's going on, you know, in the world and what the National Forum is supporting, um, we can have a good discussion afterwards, just with some kind of some real questions. So just um, the way I normally do presentations, Presentations like this is I'll be sharing a lot of examples and I find it awkward when I go to a presentation and trying to keep track of all the links and so on. So this is a Google Doc uh, that is open. Uh, I think Gerard is going to share the link there and it just lists all of the resources as well as the slides that I'm using today. So anything that I mentioned today, um, the link will be, you know, will be in that doc in case you want to follow up anything afterwards that you find interesting or, or want to dig deeper into. And as I said, I could have spoken about, and I have spoken about open education for, for many years, but what is particularly interesting, I think, in the last year is that, you know, the light has been shining on open education, you know, a, a little more intensely over the last year because um, the potential of open education to support, you know, those who teach and those who learn um, is increasingly evident, you know, given the, the, the pandemic and, you know, challenges that institutions are facing. So I'm sharing here um, a, a link to uh, a joint, a call for joint action uh, that was published by UNESCO uh, last April in the early days of the pandemic, call, literally calling on the global community to support the use of OER for sharing learning and knowledge openly worldwide. 
with a view to building, as it says, more inclusive, sustainable and resilient knowledge societies. So I see this really as a call to action for us as educators. Um, again, reinforcing work that's been done over many years already. Um, but I, although there's so many aspects of open education that I could speak about, I thought it would be most useful if um, I got an idea about what you were interested in. So I'm just going to launch a short poll here. I only have one of these, but um, it would be really interesting to get your thoughts. So this, you can, you can take as many of these as you like, but I'd really like to know you know, in thinking about open educational resources, open educational practices, I'd like to know what you'd like to do that you're not currently doing or what you'd like to do more of. And that's everything from learning more about um, OER and OEP to, you know, to doing research and creating policy. Very interesting. Okay, I think that's almost everybody who's voted now. Okay, just share the results there. Okay, that's really interesting, really helpful. Uh, obviously it, it hits on almost everything. Uh, the most popular choice is supporting students and our staff to use and create OERs. That's actually super because um, it, it helps me know what to, what to focus on today. Also uh, using OER in your teaching, uh, learning more about the potential benefits and challenges and so on. Um, if anyone um, said something else, uh, something, you know, someone chose other, obviously, maybe we can pick that up in the discussion at the end. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, so I've just divided this, my hopefully not, not too long presentation, maybe about 20 minutes and then time for chat into three areas. And the first is really nuts and bolts about what open education is and OER and OEP and why it's um, why we might use OER and OEP in teaching and learning specifically. Um, and then I, there are so many OER and OEP resources. So I've curated a set of them, um, but again, hopefully we can talk about more in the discussion and then talking about what, what next, you know, how can we actually embed these practices, you know, in our, in our institutions and in our work. So the first is kind of what and why. So we'll start with the definition, uh, all, all good academics do. Um, this, if you look up any definition of OER, you'll find some version of this. This happens to be the UNESCO one, but there's a wide agreement about what OER actually are. And they are teaching, learning and research materials in any medium, they don't have to be digital, although they tend to be, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license. And those are the two keywords in that definition, the notion of an open license. And that open license permits no cost access, use, adaptation, et cetera, by others with limited restrictions. So, you know, what essentially happens is when you, when you create anything, when you create an image, uh, a rubric, an assignment, a lesson, uh, uh, um, uh, a book, uh, it, is, it will have copyright assigned to it automatically. You don't actually have to add copyright. So um, we, let, I hope we talk about this at the, at the um, Q&A session afterwards, but you know, if you were outside an institution, just an individual in the world, it would be copyrighted to you. If you're within an educational institution, it depends on the policies at your institution, but that copyright is automatically ascribed. So copyrighted materials are flooding into the world all the time. We search on Google and so on, we find things. Um, the copyright belongs to um, the copyright holder, unless um, that copyright holder has added an open license to it or put it into the public domain. So the open license doesn't change copyright anyway. It doesn't eradicate copyright in any way. If you like, it kind of sits on top of copyright. So when that resource goes out into the world, whoever finds it on Google or you know perhaps it's shared within another resource or whatever, that open license communicates to the person who finds that resource exactly what they can do with it, you know, in their teaching, in their learning or whatever. So it's kind of an act of generosity and kind of proactive move by creators of, of um, educational materials to facilitate sharing. And, and sharing is after all, just at the heart of what we do in education. So that open license, usually what we use um, are, is, um, a creative commons licenses of, of some sort. And you, many of you might be familiar with that CC logo that's, that stands for creative commons. And if you see that logo anywhere, um, it has creative commons 
license. And these are the different letters that follow that CC usually, and they're called license elements. There's four of them. Uh, again, I'm not gonna talk too much about them now. We can chat about them more afterwards, but almost every CC license has the by element, which basically means you can use this however you want, um, but you must attribute me uh, as the owner of it. Um, some also add some of these other terms, share alike, which means you have to use the same license when you share it. Non-commercial means you can't ask people to pay for this content if you use it. And no derivatives means you have to use it exactly in the form uh, that, I've, that I've shared it. This is not, ND is not usually used for educational material because the whole point of sharing educational material is that we want to change it and adapt it. Um, for different contexts, different students and so on. But it might be used for things like a piece of music or a piece of artwork or something that someone doesn't want to change. And then this is how they're kind of strung together. So when you see a CC license, there's usually a little image, uh, those little gray and black images there. And then there's there are the terms. So it's the CC space and then whatever terms you're using connected by, by hyphens. So the most open is the one at the top CC zero. That means you don't even need to attribute me for this. Um, that's called a public domain license. And then they get more restrictive as you go down. So CC by means please attribute me, CC by SA, please attribute me and share it with the same license and so on. Um, so this is one of the decisions we need to make as, as people who might license our work is choosing which license and I'll come back to that later. So in, in thinking though beyond educational institutions, there's a lot of examples of cultural heritage collections that are being openly licensed. And there's been an acceleration of this in the last few years. Two examples here, the Smithsonian Institute in the US and the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands. So these, both of these institutions are sharing all of their, or most of their images anyway, using CC0 public domain licenses. So, you know, this is interesting as an example of OER, but also this huge body of work that we can use ourselves as educators to, you know, as, as images in our own teaching materials, but also as, as bodies of OER that we can um, guide our students in engaging with, uh, depending on what you teach. But to come back to just the educational applications, uh, probably the most popular description of OER is this one by David Wiley, which says that um, OER um, can be defined as the five R's. It's basically a set of permissions that enable you to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute uh, whatever you find. So you can find something with an open license, say, I'll use this wholesale, or I'll use this bit of it. This would be really relevant in my lecture about you know, X, Y, Z, um, so you can, as I said, you know, remix, redistribute um, in your own work. So that's the power of OER. But just like um, teaching and learning isn't just about the content, um, open education isn't just about content either. So this is where the term open educational practices come in. And it's kind of more of an umbrella term, if you like, which includes OER, but also the pedagogical practices um, which facilitate interaction, peer learning, knowledge creation and sharing, and empowerment of learners. What, building on the use of OER, if you like. So um, my question, you know, when I'm thinking about any kind of innovation and in teaching and learning and everything is why would I do this? So I just want to address that at the top here and then I'll, I'll share some examples. So uh, for me, I think it's really straightforward to think about the potential benefits of OER in these three areas, which is about enhancing access, equity and pedagogy. And I just have one slide on each of these. So access first, um, particularly in the move to emergency remote teaching and learning, which we all experienced over the course of the last year, a lot of us uh, may be teaching online for the first time or wholly online for the first time. So it was a huge push to try and develop digital teaching and learning materials if we hadn't done that before. So OER provide you know, a great source of, of materials that have been created by other teachers and by other experts, so on that we can use. Of course, the problem is curating it and, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But also for students, um, if teachers are using um, open educational resources as their teaching materials, you know, it facilitates students access uh, to those materials as well. So it increases access for students, for teachers and all who support teaching and learning. And ideally for everyone, but I put a question mark there because is it really available to everyone? And in fact, it's not really available to everyone because if those OER are available online, it means they're available really to anyone with meaningful connectivity and the knowledge and skills required to know where to find them, how to use them and so on. So um, 
I use the term meaningful connectivity. It's a term that we've been using a good bit in the last year. It's a term um, coined by the um, Alliance for Affordable Internet. Again, it's on the list of references there. And it, it kind of pushes us into a more complex discussion around the digital divide, because the digital divide um, implies that there's a divide, you know, and that it's kind of a binary online or offline. And the Alliance for Affordable Internet um, notes that it's not only between the connected and the unconnected, but that there are starkly different online experiences that people have. So they define meaningful connectivity as someone who is able to use the internet every day using an appropriate device with enough data and a fast connection. So again, that's that's allied with the whole concept of, of access. And that's why um, it's important that we also talk about equity and what um, open education and enables or can facilitate uh, in the whole area of equity. So um, first of all, it obviously can reduce the costs for students. So if students don't have to buy textbooks because their um, their lecturer or their tutor uses open textbooks, that can reduce the costs for students. Beyond that, and maybe a little more nuanced explanation of that is that students have persistent availability of resources also. So we know, for example, research done by the USI and other institutions that students, many students have experienced a great deal of financial hardship um, over the course of the past year on top of maybe existing financial hardship. So the fact that maybe students have to take a break in their studies, the fact that OER are available before, during, and after a student is enrolled in a module can be really um, meaningful um, so that they don't lose access you know, to their email and their library privileges and so on. The OER are available persistently. Um, in terms of equity, OER also are open for addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, we can better represent marginalized identities. So if you find a great resource in English and you want it to be in Irish, you know, to, to enable it to be available for others, you can, you can, you can translate that if it's available as an open education resource. Um, perhaps, you know, all of us might be familiar with uh, resources that we use that don't represent, you know, equitably in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of culture, language, and so on. And if it's an open resource, we can actually address those changes and make them more inclusive. And overall, obviously, supporting sustainable development goal number four about ensuring inclusive and quality education for all. And finally, the third area of potential benefits is perhaps the, the I can say the most about is pedagogy. Um, and that is, of course, as I mentioned, you can adapt and use OER in context, translate it to another language, create examples that are meaningful for your students or staff or your locality. Um, not only use open resources for, like open textbooks, but actually, if we think about open pedagogy, think about students co-creating OER. So uh, you can engage together with students to create OER that might be resources for other groups of people, either within or beyond um, the institution. And that opens up the whole area of authentic assessment. So, you know, a lot of us have been talking a lot this year about um, the importance of, you know, uh, ensuring academic integrity and authentic assessment. And this work has been going on in open education for a long time. So it's a great place to look for ideas about this. And if students are sharing their work openly, they are contributing to public knowledge. And by so doing, you know, developing through working with us digital and data and copyright literacies in order to be able to do that, which is, you know, lifelong literacies that they will take with them beyond the time that they're students. We can diversify the curriculum, as I said, <clears throat> and then, I mean, I could talk for a whole hour about the opportunities for local and global collaboration, but, you know, I, for example, connected my students with students in Australia and the UK and Spain in different, you know, times that I've used open educational practices because students were sharing their work openly and could remix each other's work and so on. So we can talk about that more. So just wanted to share a few uh, resources and things that, that you can maybe dig into a little bit more detail afterwards. So I'll go through these fairly quickly. Um, obviously, there are already a lot of OER and OEP resources across the Irish higher education sector. So Tell You is there, a lot of national forum funded projects all aboard, Open Teach, um, other projects, EDTL, um, you know, so many places across higher education that although you might not have called these OER and OEP before um, are actually support OER and OEP and they're all openly licensed. So they're all around us actually, OER and OEP resources. In an intentional sense, the National Forum is committed to building open capability across the sector. So probably the two main ways that we've done that is through these two guides that we published in the last year and a half. 
the National Forum Open Licensing Toolkit. If you want to openly license something you've created, a really short guide to just you know step by step go through that. Um, that was published in summer 2019, and then over the coming months, we learned that people were confused about which license they should pick. So then last summer, we produced how to choose an open license. Again, these are short, really focused guides. You know, five six pages for um, for you to use really quickly at the point you know, that you need it, that you want to openly license something. So, so that's it. So we have our guides. If you ever want to find anything that the National Forum is doing around OER, OEP, open education, open practice, you just go to the National Forum website forward slash open, and you'll find the latest work that we have there. So the guides are there, past webinars that we run and so on. We of course have open courses to support the professional development framework. They're openly licensed. We're currently, um, we've been developing uh, a new open course, which is basically a longer version of what this webinar is about using OER and OEP for teaching and learning, a four person multi-institutional team um, that I'm working with. And we're gonna share that pilot version of that course uh, in April uh, to get some feedback and also to share resources with people. All National Forum resources are available openly as a CC BY licenses, like our two guides and, and everything else that we share. And all National Forum funded resources are available openly. And we're developing the capability so that those can be searched you know, by theme, by discipline, and so on. Um, and that's going to be available later this year. And then just like this event, ongoing events, support, engagement, we're always happy to engage in discussion um, and support, you know, around particular issues around open. So a quick run through of um, some ways that people have used OEP. I know there are some examples in, in within Ireland. So what I've done now is I've tried to look beyond Ireland and we can, how we can learn from other people's practice. So number one, open textbooks. Um, this fabulous project at the University of Cape Town, um, digital open textbooks for development. You know, if you're working in open textbooks, it's a great place to look really talks about how the use of open textbooks empowers staff, empowers students, and really helps us to transform knowledge, particularly for you know, marginalized, um, marginalized communities and marginalized individuals, a way to have a voice um, in a new way. So a couple of people who are doing this, the City University of New York, you might have heard about um, Z degrees or Z degrees, which are degrees in the community college sector in the States that use all open textbooks. So students know that they have no cost um, if they do those degrees or those courses. City University of New York or CUNY actually uses a code. This ZTC OER is a code in their course directory. So when students actually elect to take a module or what's called a course section there, but we would call a module, um, they know right when they're signing up, whether or not it's, um, it uses open textbooks. And, you know, research has been done to show that's, you know, for particularly for many students, um, this is very desirable and they actually choose those modules specifically for that reason. Um, Robin DeRosa has done a lot of work in open textbooks and I, I reference her there. She started doing it to save money for students, but then found out that the pedagogical benefits, you know, of, of creating knowledge, sharing with publicly and so on, just outweighed, you know, even the, even the financial um, benefits. Second idea is OER assignments. And again, back to this discussion around, you know, how do we, how do we um, kind of uh, ensure academic integrity in ways that are not, you know, distrustful and using surveillance technologies and so on. Well, we can create OER assignments where students, instead of creating something that's a private transaction between the student and the teacher, actually they work on over time and becomes a piece of work that they share more widely, for example, with their program, with their institution, even publicly. Um, so again, an example of this, Jen Ross, the University of Edinburgh, um, I, I have a link there where she has this, actually a student showcase, has shown that it encourages students to critically evaluate um, their work in a way you know, beyond what they did for non-OER assignments. Um, and it offers a way for students to create reusable resources that have legacy um, in a really meaningful way. Um, another example, if some of you joined the, um, the National Forum webinar last November about data privacy um, and data literacy, Bonnie Stewart spoke at that, and she shared this example. These are, she's teaching education students who are training to be teachers. Um, so these students created a set of OER that anyone in the world can use, it's on, they're all on YouTube, that actually um, assess all the various ed tech kind of tools and platforms that people are using, Zoom, um, Padlet and so on. So the students are developing all these critical literacies and sharing them openly. Um, so it's their assignment 
um, and they're developing all these other capabilities as well. Third example in the line of OER assignments is editing Wikipedia. Um, I won't read that in detail there, but basically using Wikipedia as a publishing platform to empower students to think of themselves as authors and contributors um, to information. Ewan McAndrew is the Wikimedian in residence at uh, Edinburgh. And you know he talks about moving away from saying to students, don't cite Wikipedia, don't use Wikipedia, but actually teaching them about how Wikipedia is created, what the history of Wikipedia, you know, the history tab in Wikipedia means and actually writing and editing it. Um, and then there's another link I have there about the Wikipedia editing project. And finally, my last example is apart from all the uh, notion about students creating content is that, you know, in addition to connecting to content, we are, of course, are also thinking about connections between learners uh, with each other and learners and teachers. Um, and this lovely um, paper by Leslie Gorley just published last month um, brings this home in a really powerful way. Virtual learning is always in person, even when the person is alone and home in front of a screen. So this, you know, this imperative that we have to help students and staff, you know, build community with each other is so important. Um, and here's a set of OER that, that can help um, with that. Uh, again, I won't say more about that because I want to finish up uh, and leave time for questions. Um, I share two collections with you in case you want to dig into any more of like the, like some of the examples I shared are in these collections, some are not. First, Open Pedagogy Approaches. This is a US-based collection, but it's really interesting. The authors are diverse. They include teachers, students, um, and library staff in higher education. And there's a whole suite of case studies about open textbooks, open student projects, open course design, um, and they share kind of why they did it, how they did it, um, and links to the work. So really interesting kind of collection if you want to explore that in more detail. And if what I've mentioned about um, equity and social justice approaches and the importance of keeping in mind how open might further marginalize students or staff in some ways and paying attention to that, if any of that has interested in you, this collection um, will be interesting to you. I, I think I co-edited it with uh, some other wonderful people last year. Um, and it's all 43 diverse authors um, whose voices are not, you know, might be considered marginal within institutions. Um, it's kind of gray literature, really some really powerful pieces in there. So what next? Um, I'd probably like to, we'll go back up to the roof again, apart from all the details and might just want to reinforce this. This is from Creative Commons, that open education is not, it's probably best not to think of it as a short-term fix, you know, to getting digital content for teaching, but really a long-term solution in, in our collective move from this kind of, you know, initial transition to online and remote teaching to more equitable, flexible, inclusive, you know, forms of, you know, digital and blended and in-person teaching because open education can be used in all of those. Um, I leave here these guidelines from the, um, from UNESCO. Uh, when I'm thinking, when I thought about kind of what my key points I might leave people with in a presentation I gave last month, I realized it mapped almost exactly to these five areas of actions. Um, proposed by UNESCO and who am I to argue with UNESCO? So they say that really to, to, um, to build further sustainable capacity in terms of open education, these are the five things that we should really focus on. Building capacity of stakeholders, individuals to access, use, even to understand OER. Secondly, develop supportive policy. So in, in the research that I did around OEP, I, I learned the, the ways that a lack of policy speaks very loudly to people. So if your OI, intellectual property IP policy, for example, is not clear or doesn't address OER, then people will shy away probably from, from engaging with OER. If you don't have an OER policy at your institution, um, again, people will shy away from using it, no matter how much you know, individual support you're doing. There are some great examples out there. Again, University of Cape Town, University of Edinburgh, um, University of British Columbia, you know, so many great examples around policy, but this is this is a key area. And if we want to sustain open education, we need to address it. Um, support and enable inclusive and equitable quality OER. If you're familiar with open access, that's usually the term that's used when we talk about sharing uh, research outputs. Um, whereas OER is the term you usually used by people who are talk about sharing teaching and learning materials. So 
the quality of research outputs is really clear. You know, we're talking about peer review and other things, but the quality of teaching and learning resources, we want to share work that's in progress and might be used in, in niche um, contexts. So um, we need to, I think, when we're talking about OER is expand our definition of quality so that we can be sure it's inclusive and equitable. So it can include OER created by students, include OER created by, you know, institutions beyond the elite institutions in the global north, you know, include OER that might be co-created between institutions and community partnerships. So in inclusion and equity are important aspects of quality. Um, we need to nurture sustainability models and facilitate international collaboration because, as I said, there's so many people that we can learn from and institutions and organizations we can learn from. And this image is just my way of saying that um, this reinforcing the importance of a collaborative systemic approach. So from the left to the right, there are times when we will be working with an individual to help them license you know, a particular resource. Um, but then it's also important to support um, teaching and programs um, to support op open educational resources and practices at institution level and at sector level. So really, you know, again, from the National Forum, we support all of these and they're really all necessary, you know, if we want, if we want to build, again, open capability across the sector. Um, and uh, I will just end on this slide, always my final slide. Um, it's been a pretty difficult year. Um, the, the hope and a better future is kind of what keeps me going. And, you know, my, my work in open education has been a great source of that hope. I think, you know, the values upon which open education is based and many of the people who work in it um, have a really broad global view of, of kind of the future of a better, more equitable and inclusive higher education. So um, I, I think um, there's a lot of hope in, in, in open education and how we get there. So that's it. I might just stop sharing and I'm really happy to just um, join the conversation with you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Catherine, just in case there isn't the uh, opportunity later to do so. I just want to, yeah, to say thanks for such an informed overview of the whole area. There really is no replacing that kind of um, deep engaged familiarity that you have uh, with the field and, and I think ultimately what we got there was a really nice balance of the the ideology or the ideological stuff with a lot of very practical stuff around licensing and how to get started and some ideas for things to uh, to try and uh, lots of links and references obviously to follow mm -hmm. up on and a lovely quote there at the end for us to take away. Um.